Hello, everyone. We'll be starting in a few minutes. Thank you. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today uh, for this uh, important event titled uh, Black Liberation Movement. Uh, and I'm going to start uh, by uh, introducing the event in Arabic. Uh, then um, I'll, uh, I'll uh, uh, speak in English. Uh, uh, so, مرحبا جميعا شكرا لمشاركتكم معنا اليوم شكرا لحضوركم لهذا الـ 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 لهاي الندوة المهمة الندوة الخامسة عشر من سلسلة البديل الثوري اللي بنبحث فيها عن تاريخ نضال السود وحركة تحررهم من الاستعباد والاستعمار على مدار خمس قرون في مواجهة الرأس المالية والعنصرية في حوار مع الرفاق والرفقات من الولايات المتحدة نحو فهم أعمق للانتفاضة الشعبية المتواصلة ضد العنصرية والاستغلال ومؤسسات القمع وعن التحديات التاريخية والراهنة التي تواجه حركة تحرر السود وطبيعة العلاقات النضالية مع الفلسطينيين والعرب وجموع المهاجرين واللاجئين والفئات الفئات المهمشة داخل حدود الولايات المتحدة الأمريكية اليوم راح يكون عندنا ترجمة بتقدروا تدخلوا عليها من اللينك اللي موجود جنب الـ Q&A ما في عندنا ترجمة مش مكتوب هي لغة عربية مكتوب لغة فرنسية فرنش إذا بتكبسوا عليها بيكون عندنا يوسف وعمر راح يترجموا هاي الندوة مهمة جداً خلال عبر الندوات السابقة تطرقنا لسؤال اللي هو من هم أصدقاؤنا أو حلفائنا الحقيقيين حلفاء أي بديل ثوري ممكن ينولد عن الواقع اللي موجودين إحنا فيه هلا وبظل كمان الأحداث اللي بتصير في الولايات المتحدة اليوم هاي الندوة مهمة 
نبدا فيها لنتعرف عن جدع حلفائنا الحقيقيين اللي عندنا علاقه تاريخيه معهم كحركه تحرر وطنيه فلسطينيه. راح ندير اللقاء اليوم في طريقه مختلفه عن الندوات السابقه، مش راح يكون في كثير مجال لمداخلات طويله، ممكن نفتح المجال لبعض المداخلات او الاسئله و يعني هاي المرة كمان راح نعطي الأولوية للشخصيات الاعتبارية والبرجوازية اللي موجودة معنا اليوم فشو اسمه بمزحش معكم يعني فخليكم معنا ومنشوف بس راح تكون زي ما حكيت منديرها في طريقة مختلفة و... وكمان مرة الترجمة موجودة على اللينك جنب الـ Q&A بتقدر تدخل على اللغة الفرنسية اللي هي اللغة العربية مش موجود لغة عربية أوكي so uh, I, I will introduce the event uh, on behalf of the revolutionary alternative webinar series uh, and behalf, uh, on behalf of Samidun and PYM I welcome you and thank you for joining us today for this important webinar titled The Black Liberation Movement, Cent Centuries of Struggle. Um, it's an honor to have you with us today, uh, comrades. It's, uh, uh, it's, this event is part of a webinar series uh, uh, in Arabic that was launched a few months ago, and this is the 15th webinar. Uh, and uh, during the past webinars, we really uh, started asking ourselves a question, uh, a simple question around who are our allies around the world, who are our uh, real friends uh, fighting imperialism and colonialism uh, uh, around the world. And uh, with what happened uh, here in the US really led us to this important webinar. So I want to start by extending our salutation to the uprising led by the black community. Uh, the black communities here in the US, we salute their dedication to bringing justice to George Floyd and all martyrs. And it's our duty uh, to support the protest and the demands of the black community today. Um, we know that our relationship is historic and existed, existed since the 60s. Um, both the Palestinian liberation movement and the black uh, liberation movement had a strong relationship where they supported each other uh, materially. They exchanged experiences and analysis of colonialism and imperialism uh, to really strengthen each other as uh, both movements. And uh, we often hear uh, uh, analogies, uh, comparisons between experiences of different communities as a sub substitute of solidarity or uh, uh, as a sub substitute for actual engagement. Uh, our alignment with uh, other communities and struggles for justice is not based or is not only based on comparison of shared experiences, but instead we are thinking about fighting intertwined systems of oppressions, shared principles and shared vision for liberation. Uh, it's about articulating and practicing a liberation ethic not only regarding our own struggles, but others as well. Um, and I really want to say that the black struggle is so crucial. As, as Palestinians in diaspora, as Palestinians in the US, our youth who are leading the Student for Justice in Palestine on campuses, uh, our uh, youth who are leading the fight uh, for Palestine in the community, uh, actually got politicized through the black struggle. Uh, they got politicized through the words of Malcolm X, uh, Fred Hampton, Angela Davis, and so many other revolutionary fig figures. So it's important for us to recognize that. It's also important for us to recognize that without the achievements of the Black Liberation Movement against re racism, imperialism, white supremacy, we wouldn't be able to organize today in the US. We wouldn't be able to resist uh, injustice in this country. The black community paved the way for oppressed people to resist and fight for our collective and connected struggle. Um, 
with that being said, at the same time, we know that the fight is not done. Uh, racism still exists. Colonialism st still exists. White supremacy still exists and it's growing. So what we uh, want to say today as Palestinians, um, um, we pledge our unconditional support to the Black Liberation Movement. And we are here to say that um, your fight is our fight. And we're here to follow your uh, lead. So thank you and love to have us here today. And now I want to uh, pass it uh, to Christian to facilitate this uh, uh, event. And again, uh, uh, we will be providing translation. So please, uh, you can find, find it uh, on the bottom right uh, next to the Q&A. Uh, you can press on uh, French for Arabic, uh, or you can stay on the English one. Uh, 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 Christian, please go ahead. We can't hear you. Hello, comrades. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, uh, salamat to uh, Ms. al Khair, to everybody in uh, the Bled who is tuning in today. Uh, especially greetings to our, our comrades in the camps, um, whether you're in Dehesha or uh, the camps in Lebanon at Al Nadi Sakafi or the uh, Al Marquez Al Nakab. Um, we're very happy to be talking with you and to be talking with everybody who is uh, tuning in this afternoon or evening or morning, wherever you are. Um, my name is Christian Davis Bailey. I am a co founder of Black for Palestine, which for the last uh, four or five years has been focused on building solidarity and connections between the Black Liberation Movement and the Palestinian Liberation Movement. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about where that work started later in the conversation. Um, I uh, really appreciate uh, Sami Doon and PYM and um, all the co-sponsors of, of today's event. Um, so before I, we get to introducing um, the other speakers for today, I just wanted to start with some opening context about the moment we're in and why we're having this conversation. Um, this text mostly comes from, um, for those who are uh, listening in Arabic, you can read this article in Arabi um, on Al Adab's website. Um, and I, I'll ask the organizers to share a link in the, the chat, um, but just give me one moment. Um, and just as I read, uh, the picture in the background is of uh, a mural in uh, the Haitian camp of, of George Floyd and Iyad Halak, uh, who were each martyred um, within the last month or so. So the moment that we're in um, is in the context of high profile incidents of anti-Black violence um, by white supremacist police and settlers in the United States. Uh, these incidents include the murder of 26-year-old uh, paramedic worker, Brianna Taylor, who was killed during a police raid while she was in her bed. Um, it also comes in the context of three settler vigilantes shooting and killing 25-year-old black jogger, uh, or a black man named Ahmed Arbery, um, hunting him down in their car after, while he was running through his neighborhood. And the murder of 46-year-old George Floyd, who was killed on May 25th in Minneapolis by police. Um, and this all comes in the context of the coronavirus pandemic, where the U.S. has uh, just massively failed to support um, its, its population. And so George Floyd was killed after a police officer uh, uh, kneeled on his neck for almost 10 minutes, despite his repeated plea that I can't breathe. And this incident was recorded on video by a bystander while three other police officers stood by as accomplices in George's murder. 
Um, on the same day as George's murder, a white woman in New York City made national headlines after a video was published of her making a, a call to police um, that a black man she encountered in the park was threatening her safety. Um, and this was blatantly false. Um, and so this incident touched a, a deep nerve among black people in the United States uh, because it, it reminds us of one of the most high profile examples of uh, lynching or the brutal murder of black people that happened in Mississippi in 1955. Uh, this is an incident when a 14 year old named Emmett Till was, was killed after he was falsely accused by a white woman of, of making sexual advances towards her in a store. Following this accusation, Emmett was kidnapped from his home by white settlers, brutally beaten, shot, and dumped in a river with a 70 pound fan or a 32 kilogram fan tied to his body. Emmett's mother famously decided to leave the, the casket open for her son's funeral, display, displaying his disfigured body for the whole world to see, which catalyzed a shift within the black community that pushed us towards the civil rights movement. And it's worth noting that uh, the, the people who killed Emmett Till were all acquitted by a jury of, of fellow settlers or fellow white people. And over 50 years later, the woman who made the ac accusation against Emmett made, uh, admitted that part of her accusation was, was false. So uh, George Floyd's murder and these, these incidents of racial violence um, uh, uh, just sparks kind of a powder keg among uh, the black community living in the United States. His murder also calls to mind the murder of Eric Garner in 2014 by police in New York City. Uh, Eric Garner was similarly killed due to a police chokehold and was also heard pleading, I can't breathe in his final moments. Uh, the phrase I can't breathe became a rallying cry during Black Lives Matter protests at the time. And so George Floyd's murder has provoked uh, massive demonstrations all around the country and even around the world. Um, though in my opinion, it's unclear whether these uh, demonstrations are going to manifest in meaningful challenges to the violence and racism of the settler state and uh, of the role that police play in this country. And we can talk about that in the discussion. Throughout the protest, there's been immense uh, police violence against the protesters and Trump has even threatened in, uh, to activate the military against protesters. Um, and so um, what I, I, I would like people to take away from this conversation um, is to understand that the violence against Black people in the United States um, is not just about an issue of racism, it's a natural byproduct of US settler colonialism that is rooted in the oppression of African and indigenous people. Um, for any uh, 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 Black viewers on this call, I hope that you can understand that our struggle is an anti-colonial one that aligns with other colonized people all around the world. Um, and to those who are, are viewing from the United States who are not black and indigenous, I encourage you to use this time to consider your own role or a position um, within a, a settler society that's rooted in the oppression of us as black people and our indigenous family. Um, and so to our, our comrades in the BLAD who might not have much familiarity with our struggle, um, I, I ask you throughout this event to understand uh, Africans living in the West um, and in the United States as one of the oldest victims of European colonization. Um, we've been colonized for over 500 years when we were torn away from our homelands and brought to the Americas as enslaved people. Um, and we, we've been colonized to the point that we don't know where in Africa we come from. We don't have our mother tongues or languages um, and we have lost some of our indigenous cultures and practices. Um, so the, the, my, my hope for this conversation is that we can understand um, the role that Black people within the United States and Africans more broadly play in the broader anti-colonial struggle um, and to, to ask our Palestinian comrades to um, continue and to increase their support for us. And so um, with that in mind, I um, would like to uh, bring in our, our guest speakers for this conversation today. Um, who are two comrades whose work and analysis and minds I very deeply respect. They, they might even be two of the comrades whose work I, I most respect in this world. Um, the first is Onya San Wu. Oh, okay, I'll, I'll slow down for translation, I'm sorry. And uh, thanks for the reminder. Um, the first speaker is uh, Onya San Wu Shatoyer from the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Um, and the second speaker is Murad Ode, who is a just really great Palestinian comrade. Um, and I will ask each of you just to spend a few minutes 
um, introducing yourself, the organizations you're part of, and, and um, how you would like to frame this conversation or what you hope people can take away. And on your time, we'll start with you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Christian. Um, thank you for that really great introduction. Thank you to the organizations that are hosting this really important discussion for having me. Really grateful for the space. Really excited for this convo because it's much needed. So my name is Onya Sangwe Chatoye. I'm an organizer with the All African People's Revolutionary Party and the All African Women's Revolutionary Union. That is a revolutionary, so the union is the woman's wing of the All African People's Revolutionary Party or the APRP. And the APRP is a revolutionary mass Pan-African Socialist Party founded in Africa 52 years ago by Kwame Nkrumah. Kwame Nkrumah was the first democratically elected president of the first African nation to gain independence on the continent, Ghana. And when Ghana gained its independence from British colonialism, Kwame Nkrumah declared that Ghana's independence was meaningless without the total liberation of Africa, our home, and also the entire African diaspora. He said, any person of African descent, no matter where they exist in the world, whether it be here in occupied Tiwa territory, also known as Albuquerque, New Mexico, where I am, whether it be in Honduras, where my family's from, whether it be in Haiti, whether it be in Chicago, whether they be in the Congo, whether they be in Azania, that they are Africans and they belong to the African nation. And that in order to realize our liberation, we as African people must unite and organize to unify and liberate Africa from all forms of foreign domination, all forms of imperialism, and all forms of capitalism. So I'm a revolutionary pan-African socialist is the short way of saying that. Um, and one really, really important um, consideration in terms of how I as a pan-Africanist and how revolutionary African nationalists um, conceptualize the African liberation struggle is as not an anti-racist struggle, which is kind of like the dominant framing in the United States, unfortunately, but as a national liberation struggle as a struggle against colonialism, as a struggle against imperialism, as a struggle for self-determination. So the difference between an anti-racist struggle and an anti-colonial struggle is an anti-racist struggle presumes that you want to be um, more equitably treated within settler colonial society or capitalist society. An anti-colonial struggle presumes that you want to overthrow that society and replace it with one that is humane and just. So that's like in a nutshell what I'm about and what I believe and what I'm going to bring to this conversation. Um, I do work in Occupy Tiwa territory in New Mexico around political education, around community defense, organizing African people to build independent political power and self-determination. And I also um, do a lot of work with indigenous organizations, like that's a core um, component of APRP's work is building uh, relationships with other oppressed people struggles. So in the United States on Turtle Island, that is indigenous people as well. And I am also an editor for Hood Communist, hoodcommunist.org, which is a revolutionary African nationalist blog. So that's in a nutshell what I'll do, what I do, and I'll pass it to you the next comment. Uh, well, thanks, Christian um, and um, Samidun, PYM. And uh, my name is Murad. I'm a Palestinian refugee um, from a village called Deraban. I, I was born and raised in a refugee camp in West Bank, worked with the refugees, especially youth, uh, all my life. And then I had uh, um, uh, the chance to be here in the US. And, uh, and I'm honored to be on this panel and to participate in this conversation uh, that both uh, raised so many uh, important questions for ourselves as Palestinians and uh, what do we do here in the US and how to participate. Uh, in the liberation of uh, our indigenous uh, and black uh, brothers and sisters. Uh, it's so important for us as Palestinians to acknowledge that if we are not, if we are here in the US, uh, the system uh, is designed for us, if we are not saying anything to participate in the oppression of other people. And we need to be consciously existing here. If we are here, we need to be conscious about everything we are doing uh, and how is that impacting our life uh, back home in Palestine and for our struggle. Uh, the questions are um, really what we want to discuss and be discussing is like, what do, uh, like the experience that I had the chance to, to live in Ferguson and Minneapolis, what does that mean to, to me as a Palestinian and how we can um, 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 like gather a kind of uh, lessons that we can both uh, accumulate uh, on this experience and how to benefit from
this is a great moment for us to uh, push forward uh, and uh, exceed uh, the level of uh, drawing similarities between our fights, how to learn and to build on these experiences that have been accumulating for hundreds of years. Uh, how to use it back home and here and wherever we do exist because um, it's really important to see the connections between uh, systematic oppressions that people around the world have been living uh, and what does it mean for us oppressed and people who are fighting for decades uh, to connect our fights and how to use it uh, in our liberation. So thanks and I move it to you, Christian. Thank you, Murad. Um, and I, I just want to say a little bit more about um, just why I appreciate the work that each of you do. Um, on Yasanu, you summarized our struggle in a nutshell. Um, and the, the ultimate vision being a, a pan-African socialist and internationalist liberation, um, which requires the liberation of people all around the world in our fights against imperialism. And um, Murad, I have the honor and privilege to um, meet for the first time in the, the midst of the uprising in Ferguson in 2014, um, following the police murder of Mike Brown, who was an 18-year-old black man. Um, and Murad is, is, is part of a small core of Palestinians um, in St. Louis who are engaged in very principled uh, solidarity and joint struggle with the, the, the Black struggle um, in St. Louis and in Ferguson. Um, and time after time has just shown a deep commitment to internationalism and to supporting our struggle. Um, and so I, I want to uplift each of their voices and perspectives in this conversation. Um, so just as we move forward, sorry about that. As we move forward, um, I, I wanted to offer um, two additional pieces of context and that's just to help us understand the uh, colonial and racist nature of police in the United States. Um, so as, as we know, the, the so-called United States was founded on the um, genocide um, and colonization of indigenous people and land and the enslavements of, of, of African people. Um, the, the, some of the first police forces in the United States were founded as slave patrols um, to catch Africans who were running away from their conditions of captivity and seeking freedom and to bring them back into slavery. Um, these uh, uh, police forces also were tasked with defending um, settlements or the land colonized by European settlers from the indigenous people whose land was stolen from them. Um, and uh, those two core functions to um, police the lives and boundaries of black people and to protect property that across the board is stolen indigenous land and, and territory are the two primary roles that police have served from their inception in the United States all the way through today. Um, and so I, I just want to start um, uh, with this current moment that we're in, in um, these protests and demonstrations against police brutality um, for George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and others. Um, and to ask you, Onyesan, uh, what do you make of this moment? Um, what, what's new right now in terms of oppression and resistance? And um, yeah, just what, what, what's your analysis of what's happening right now? Yeah, thanks. So what's new is like interesting phrasing because it feels like not a lot. <laughs> it feels like um, it definitely, so throughout the entire history of my people on this land, there have been these moments of uprising. Like even during the child slavery, even during the transatlantic trans slave trade, there were moments where of like conflagration where there were spontaneous uprisings of African people against our conditions because it just reached a breaking point, right? And so like this pattern of uprising, spontaneous uprising in response to barbarism is very, very old on this land and I continue, I consider like the, the uprising against police terrorism as part of that same continuum. Cause exactly, like, just like you said, you know, the, the modern police state, the modern police force began as patrols of deputized vigilant Europeans um, attempting to re-enslave African people and murder African people and also protecting European settlements. Like that is, there's a direct line between modern policing and that history. So I definitely consider what's happening now is like part of that same continuum of African resistance against colonization, against US imperialism. Um, it's interesting to see um, sort of like the spontaneous organization, the spontaneous mobilizations unfolding in like a very similar way to how they did six years ago. I would say one of the primary differences is like the state response. 
like this weird combination of like corporate and like political acceptance of the movement, like Mitt Romney saying Black Lives Matter, which is disgusting. Like every every place I've ever bought, like ever I've purchased something from in like the past years, like sending emails that say Black Lives Matter. But then at the same time, police are blinding people, maiming people, like like grievously injuring people, like all kinds of people for being in the street at this particular moment. So there's like a, on the one side, the ruling class attempting to embrace what's happening and, and funnel in a very particular way that maintains their power. And on the other side, there's like naked state repression on a scale that is new for the United States. So it's a, it's a very interesting moment. Um, I can say like some of the demands are also moving to the left. Like six years ago, I was saying abolish the police and people were like, what are you talking about? And now there's like op-eds in the New York Times saying defund the police, abolish the police. And again, like that's movement leftward, but you also see the ruling class like moving to say, okay, sweet, we'll defund the police. We're gonna decide what that looks like and we're gonna replace it with something worse. So yeah, it's been like a, like the past month and it's really only been a month. He was murdered, George Floyd was murdered on African Liberation Day, which is a worldwide Pan-African holiday that most people are not aware of outside of our movement. Um, and then in the month that's passed, there's been like mobilizations all over the world. Uh, but it just, yeah, it's just uh, the level of organization and like the level of analysis is, feels very, very familiar, I guess, from the past six years. Yeah, thank you. I, I was also going to mention that these calls for abolition, um, the mainstreaming of them feels, feels very different. Um, for those unfamiliar with the idea, um, abolition just means to, to completely remove a structure and replace it with something um, new, ideally better, but that doesn't always happen. Um, but in, in the context of police, the argument that um, Black people and, and other um, uh, comments have been making for decades is that the institution of police in the United States is, is structurally, you can't fix it. It will always be racist, it will always be violent, it will always be oppressive. Um, therefore, we need to abolish or remove police and replace it with new institutions. Um, in many cases, people are calling for um, different forms of community safety. Um, given that most of the role that police serve in the US is things like um, writing tickets for someone whose taillight is out on their car or um, responding to people who are in uh, distress due to mental health issues. Um, the argument is that people with guns should not be the ones responding to these issues and putting black people and others in life-threatening situations. It should be uh, professionals who are actually trained in, in mental health um, uh, resources or who um, are just city servants and not deputized uh, uh, killers. Um, Another difference that I'm seeing right now um, is the, I mean, this is coming in the context again of the, the pandemic um, and of uh, Americans by and large being failed by the, the state, um, people not wanting, or specifically right-wing settlers not wanting to stay in their homes. Um, and then the second that a black that uprising starts, we, we hear the reverse narrative. Oh, why are they protesting? They need to be staying at home. Um, and we've even seen uh, armed, um, uh, not militias, but armed settlers or, or right-wing people um, uh, uh, at counter demonstrations. So I believe um, somewhere in New Mexico, our indigenous comrades um, were working to take down a statue of a, uh, a Spanish colonizer who committed genocide against them. Um, and settlers showed up with guns and, and shot a protester. Um, so the, the, the stakes I think are, are feel very high just given, um, yeah, given the vulnerabilities that everybody in this country is facing, but, um, it's part of the contradictions that we're, we're working in. Um, so yeah, actually let, let's, let's, I'm glad you brought up Ferguson because this is the most immediate moment that might be in people's minds, um, um, compared to what's happening now. And um, I'll just share a few pictures from that era, uh, if I can find the right link.
Right, so the, the last um, major moment of, of Black uprising on this territory um, was in 2014, as I said, when Michael Brown was killed in uh, Ferguson, Missouri, which is a state in the Midwest. Um, and this happened in the context of Israel's last assault, major assault on Gaza in 2014. Um, and as a result of each of these incidents of, of uprising and protest and, and dissent and oppression, um, we saw a resurgence of solidarity between Black and Palestinian uh, uh, struggles. But this is what the situation in Ferguson looked like, where you had essentially militarized police in poor Black communities, um, instituting curfews, shooting people with tear gas and rubber bullets, um, bringing military tanks into uh, uh, Black neighborhoods, again, at the same time as, as Israel was um, massacring people in Gaza. Um, and we even saw um, that the tear gas being used in Palestine and in, in Ferguson was made by the same company in the United States. Um, it's, it's this moment that kind of, it, in a way, burst the so-called Black Lives Matter movement, even though I'd like to be clear that um, many of the initial activists on the ground in Ferguson uh, do not identify as part of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, the people on the street in Ferguson weren't activists. They were people who were from the community and responding to violence against them. Um, and, and due to the ways in which NGOs try to co-opt movements um, with funding and speaking and things like that, um, the so-called Black Lives Matter kind of took the spotlight. Um, but I, I wanna be clear that this moment was birthed out of um, Black suffering and Black resistance um, of, of primarily working class, poor, and, and unorganized people. Um, so it's out of this moment in which um, I become politically activated in my work with Black for Palestine. It's out of this moment that Black Lives Matter becomes kind of a national conversation and even global conversation um, with delegations to Palestine. Um, but uh, yeah, just as any movement has its own kind of ebbs and flows. And so, um, Personally, I felt that the, the movement for Black Lives um, has been at a bit of a standstill after uh, maybe two or three years of solid protests and demonstrations and visibility. Um, and so this moment that we're in right now is, is bringing that um, energy and attention back. Um, and it's especially interesting because um, unlike 2014 in Palestine was also part of the conversation Right now, we are solely focused on the Black struggle and, and how we can be in solidarity with Black revolution. Um, yeah, so it's on your side, I wanted to ask, um, are there any additional differences that you see between um, this last moment in 2014 and, and where we are right now? Um, definitely like the, the, the narrow domestic focus, like you just pointed out, like there was an attempt to internationalize it, um, which was the result of organizing um, six years ago, like there were connections being made with the Palestinian national liberation struggle. There were connections being made to what, you know, African people are experiencing across contexts all over the world. Um, you know, Black Lives Matter activists, movement for Black Lives activists would travel to Brazil, would travel to Azania and like intentionally build those connections. Whereas this time, there is like a very narrow domestic focus. And there's also a focus on individual um, African victims of police terrorism. It's focusing on like the one person rather than like the overall trend rather than the overall system that's producing these conditions. And I think that's a regression, to be honest, like a political regression. Because for the internationalization piece, like it is an absolute fact that African people all over the world, including on the continent, are suffering as a result of US terrorism. The US police is a domestic occupying force and the US military is an international occupying force. AFRICOM is the US military footprint on the African continent. Is responsible for the deaths of hundreds of African people, children, grandfathers, um, you know, families uh, through drone warfare. Like the exact same thing that we're seeing happening in Afghanistan, Afghanistan. And in the Middle East, was happening to African people in Africa at the hands of the United States. And you can't get folks to talk about that. But on our side, right, in the US side, there's like this narrow focus, this domestic focus. But what you're seeing around the world is folks making that connection. Like in the months since George Floyd was murdered, on camera, there have been solidarity actions all over Africa in Ghana, Namibia, Azania, uh, Nigeria, like all over the African continent, folks have been having demonstrations, um, speaking out against police terrorism in the United States and making these connections to, you know, imperialist terrorism in Africa and throughout the diaspora. For some, 
some reason though, and I think it's like a, it's a direct consequence of how like the ruling class is like trying to embrace what's happening. Um, people have like this narrow focus here and it needs to be widened. We need to make these connections between what is happening to African people on this land and what's happening to African people all over the world. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, I think th those are the two biggest kind of challenges I would identify with our struggle at the moment um, is getting stuck within the borders of the United States. And um, just, there are more people moving towards a more systemic and structural analysis of like the role of police in the country and just the, the racist roots of this country. Um, but um, using the frame on Yusan, we started with of anti-racism versus anti-colonialism. Um, we're still largely stuck in an anti-racist framework, which makes it difficult to um, build robustly or in, engage in, in, in true international solidarity and joint struggle um, across our diaspora and across borders, um, um, which I imagine some of this might resonate with uh, the Palestinian struggle um, in, in the moment that you all are in. Um, and that's where I'd like to go next is um, just diving deeper into the context of uh, the Black struggle in the U.S. as an anti-colonial struggle, um, the broader context of um, African and third world anti-colonialism and international solidarity, um, and yeah, just, just looking at our, our struggle in, in the broader context of moments when our revolution was stronger and where we had connections, stronger connections between the Palestinian movement and Black movement and, and other liberation struggles. Um, which wasn't really a question, but it is kind of a question. So if, if you have any um, initial thoughts on this song. Yeah, I do, for sure. Like I said, I consider this particular moment of African uprising part of a continuum that's five centuries long. Like from the moment that Europeans set foot on our land, on the shores of Africa, African people have been resisting foreign domination and that did not stop during the slave trade. It just intensified during the slave trade. Um, we were constantly struggling against European colonialism and European imperialism. The slave trade was an act of European imperialism. It was one of the first acts alongside stealing indigenous people's land. And so we were constantly resisting it. We were constantly building alliances with other folks who were suffering from similar forms of domination, like indigenous nations all around the world. And so if we understand that, if we understand that the struggle that we're in right now started five centuries ago, if we understand that it has always been anti-colonial in essence, meaning that when we were struggling against chattel slavery, we weren't like, man, I would like to be a citizen of European settler society. We were like, no, we want to go home or we want to build independent African nations on this land. We don't want to assimilate into that nonsense. So if we understand that that was always the objective and with the moment we're living in right now, where folks are like, we got to vote for Biden, we have to have body cameras, we need intrinsic, or what is it, implicit bias training? <laughs> like that's like a departure from the overall strategy which we have pursued for most of our national liberation struggle. Like this particular moment where the focus is about, um, you know, tinkering around the edges of settler society to make them treat us not like animals or not like, you know, a disposable population, like that's new. That is a new tactic. And I feel like we have to have a serious conversation about how effective it's actually been. Because the reality situation is that the default when we talk about you know, African liberation strategies at this point is like voting for a particular candidate, registering people to vote, forming a nonprofit organization or an NGO, and basically just trying to assimilate into settler colonial society, which is at its essence genocidal against us and indigenous people. So like I would I think a conversation about the strategies we have pursued for probably like the last 30, 40 years is like sorely needed. It's sorely needed because there, it was like, people act like um, this, this, this progression towards um, focusing on assimilation was just like a natural, a natural consequence of where our struggle went. But the reality is it's a consequence of like direct strategies of counterinsurgency and counterrevolution. Like the reason why the default at this point is passive assimilation in, in, as resistance is because it was an intentional strategy. The revolutionary nationalist components of our movement, like the Black Panther Party, like the Black Liberation Army, like the Revolutionary Action Movement, like you know, anti-colonial um, parties all over the African continent and diaspora were intentionally targeted by the ruling class, by imperialism, were you know, targeted for um, imprisonment, targeted for straight up assassinations. Um, you know, discredited in the mainstream. And it's only because that happened 
that the default became, you know, vote for the lesser evil, vote for Clinton or Biden, as Clinton or Biden murdered African people all over the world. Yeah, and I, I'd like to um, talk a little bit more about what happened before um, our revolutionary movements were were attacked and, and destroyed, um, because it was the moment that was really threatening to the um, imperial power of the United States, both within its borders and outside. Um, and that's the moment of the six, late 60s and 70s um, that most of you know of as the, the, the Black Panther moment. But um, it was much broader than the Black Panther Party. There were many Black revolutionary organizations um, that were fighting for liberation um, in the sense of defending and protecting communities by any means necessary, um, viewing um, uh, uh, us as Black people, not as citizens of this country, but as captives and even um, um, combatants of this country, um, which led to, to decades of political imprisonment for, for many of our revolutionaries from that era. But what was so um, powerful and challenging about that moment is that it was a moment of uh, uh, just Black commitment to anti-capitalism and socialism, Black commitment to anti-imperialism, internationalism. Um, this is the context in which, in which Black revolutionaries last engaged with Palestinian revolutionaries um, on, on the level of, of liberation movements um, and organizations. Um, with the Black Panthers meeting with the PLO and Algiers, um, Black Panther leaders and even people like Muhammad Ali visiting the refugee camps in, in Lebanon and Lebanon um, and, and meeting with Palestinians who are engaged in resistance. Um, this is also a moment where the Palestinian revolution was training and supporting African revolutionaries all around the continent and the diaspora in terms of armed struggle and, 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 and struggle in general. Um, and so I, I, I think for almost at similar timelines and for similar reasons, um, each of our liberation struggles was attached to the point in which we are today, which is dealing with, with the issues of political fragmentation, um, of NGOs kind of dominating our struggle and setting the, the, the political ceiling or limit of what discourse is among the, the average um, person in our communities. Um, and it's really a moment that we, we, we don't need just solidarity. We actively need to be working with each other to dig ourselves out of the, the, the um, hole that our oppressors and, and the counter-revolution has dug for us. Um, so that's what um, is at stake in, in this moment and why uh, it's so important for everybody to understand um, uh, joint struggle and, and solidarity with our, our struggle um, in the United States. Um, so at this point, well, uh, Onyasan, was there anything else you wanna say or discuss um, in this initial section? No, I think we covered it. Okay. Um, so Mr. Murad, you are on deck, um, but I'd like to bring you in just to um, share more context about, yeah, just about your experiences um, here in the United States and witnessing Black revolution and, and supporting Black uprisings. Um, because you have a very unique perspective as somebody who was born and raised in the camp um, and um, uh, what's the word? I don't know, just you, you were raised in a condition of, of struggle and occupation. Um, and almost immediately when you arrive to the United States, get to witness another type of occupation and another type of struggle and uprising. Um, so I'm wondering if you can share some of your, your observations about either what you've learned from the Black struggle living here um, or what you brought from back home and applied uh, on the ground here. Yeah, thanks. Um, it's um, like reading about the Black uh, struggle and movement uh, in the US is one thing and experiencing it in first person is another thing. It's um, just you can't as a Palestinian who uh, came to the US in 2013 uh, for a couple of years, um, you can't avoid seeing the injustices on a daily basis um, um, that the, our brothers and sisters are experiencing from housing to education to every single part of their lives. Um, I, when I saw uh, Mike Brown being shot and killed holding his hands up, 
it was a call for me as a Palestinian, as a mirror, like I saw myself uh, in that position. And I, uh, every day building on this uh, experience, just questioning and seeing like, what am I doing here as a Palestinian and how I'm participating in this uh, movement. And um, then like not um, far away from uh, uh, Mike Brown, uh, two blocks from my house, um, I saw uh, Van der Myers was shot two blocks from my house and seeing him bleeding to death with the police surrounding him. And that uh, recalled so many uh, experiences that I've seen and witnessed back home as a Palestinian. And um, that shook me like so deeply to recall everything I learned about the US and um, uh, just seeing the connections. Uh, and I'm at the point where uh, to see that uh, we have enough um, experiences and stories to connect our str struggles and see the similarities. And how my question is always how to move beyond. Who are, what are we trying to uh, prove for, our, for ourselves and to others? Like we have already the stories are so connected, how to build on them and learn from each other experiences. And most importantly, how to show up in community when you are in the US or anywhere else in the world as a Palestinian or as a person who is dealing with or under oppression. When um, the war in, in Gaza started in 2014, uh, I was in the US uh, in Ferguson and in the streets um, and just thinking about how, or how um, it relates our struggle when I'm holding the Gaza sign and on the other hand, I'm still holding uh, Mike Brown uh, face and uh, a sign, it meant so much to me. I did not need to um, invent a new thing, like separate the fights to support my people and the people in the um, like black and indigenous people in the United States. I have, um, it has been um, like my conclusion to that is from things that I've learned from back home and from my being here is uh, the closer you are to revolution uh, and to resistance, the more close uh, or the closer you are to reality, to people and to yourself. And this is how I viewed the things. People are fighting and the fight itself is our rescue and our key to reject normalization and to reject uh, hopelessness. And here I am today in Minneapolis too, I was lucky, you know, to see, um, I don't know if it's luck or whatever it is, but I'm here in both places and both times I'm in the US and witnessing another uprising. Uh, um, uh, just seeing the level of engagement from people, community uh, protecting each other. This is, I connect with people here on two levels. Just the level of oppression that they are dealing with now, um, the systems of uh, oppression that our indigenous black brothers and sisters are living under on the daily life basis. Uh, and the second thing is like this communal resistance that have been building up for uh, hundreds of years. I learned so much as a Palestinian being here. I learned so much about myself first and about others and other struggles. And always the question is how to uh, be connected because we know back home uh, and this is a question for us as Palestinians. Back home, we had uh, during the 60s, 70s, a big and strong connection to uh, um, revolutionary movements around the world. And these connections have been cut and replaced with others, like uh, the you know, former relationships with Saudi Arabia government and with other governments around the world that have not reflected on the true uh, cause that we are fighting for and that impacted our mentality and history like how to now and it's an overdue statement how to rebuild these connections and how to use this time uh, to uh, connect and hear and learn and exchange knowledge from other brothers and sisters around the world who are uh, working uh, dealing with oppression thank you Rafiq um we didn't see your face, but we, we do see this um, image. And I, I'm, I'm wondering if, if you just want to speak to what the, the image means, or represents. Yeah, um, first, like each time I put the, inter the camera, I lose connection. Okay. My internet is not strong, but uh, this, this is Palestine for me. 
it's um, it's it's the land uh, it's the resistance ongoing resistance um, yeah it's the ongoing fight this is palestine for me thank you mm -hmm. uh, and I, I appreciate that Palestine is a, a woman in this picture because um, it's very easy for each of our liberation struggles to center around male figures. Um, but we know that historically it is women, um, not only who are part of revolutionary organizations, but also who do the day-to-day -day community building work that's necessary to um, just keep the, the community and, and the masses moving um, toward, towards revolution. And, um, thank you for the note to include queer people as well, um, who have always been part of, of our liberation struggles, who are part of our liberation struggles. Um, uh, it, we, we really have to understand that every person in our community is, is part of our, our struggles for, for, for liberation. Um, so I, I want to um, not switch topics. It's, 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 there's a few things to share. Um, one additional takeaway that I, I hope people have from this event is understanding that um, our struggle as Africans in the United States is a struggle for self-determination. Um, and that um, it's not simply an issue of uh, racism or brutality or violence from police. Um, th th there's, and I, I, what, right now what I'm doing is reading from um, an article I, I published in the electronic electronic intifada uh, last week about how Palestine advocates can better support the black struggle. Um, and so in, in this article, I write that in every part of this country, there are black people actively building toward their liberation. There are black farmers who are working to secure land and resources so that their communities can be food secure and self-sufficient. Um, there are many different meeting spaces for black radical organizations um, that host just any type of organizing you can think of, whether it's around education, justice, um, access to clean water, uh, access to food or healthcare, um, um, really any type of, 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 of struggle. Um, many of these places for uh, Black organizers to meet are, are coming under threat due to uh, colonization, due to settlers coming in, raising rent, and, and pushing people out. Thank you. Um, thank you to the, the translators. I, I'm Sorry for speaking a little bit too quickly, um, but we'll ask all the, the panelists to just try to slow down a little bit. Um, and I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you a, a moment to breathe. Um, but the, the point here is that in every part of the country and every period of this country, um, there are black revolutionaries who are actively seeking the, the freedom of our people. Um, and in very similar ways to the, the struggle for Palestine. Um, because at the end of the day, um, uh, each of our struggles is, it, it's rooted in land. Um, it's rooted in the ability to determine um, where and how we live and the ability to feed our uh, communities, our children, our families, our nations, um, and our abilities just to, to live a life with dignity. Um, so a lot of times it gets, boiled out to, to much larger ideas, um, but at the root of it, it's really about self-determination. Um, and so it's, it's in that context that I, I want to um, raise a, a conversation that has come up a lot in the US um, since the Ferguson uprising started, um, which is the, the role that not just Palestinian Americans, but Arab Americans in general and, and immigrants or, or people who are not black, um, play in either supporting the struggles of black people or supporting the conditions of our uh, oppression and, and exploitation. Um, uh, because for, for those who aren't aware, um, the, so George Floyd was killed because um, somebody thought that he was using a fake $20 bill and called the police. Um, the, the, the store um, where George Floyd allegedly used this, this fake bill was owned by a Palestinian American. Um, and so this sparked a lot of conversations um, um, within the community about um, just the, the structural role that um, immigrants and, and people of color um, can play in, in perpetuating anti-Black racism or oppression. Um, 
because if you look more broadly around the nation, especially in cities like Detroit, which is the largest black city in the country, which immediately neighbors Dearborn, which has the largest Arab population in the country, um, you can see a, a um, structure of, of exploitation or, or racism against the um, black community. So for example, in Detroit, most of the gas stations and liquor stores are owned by Arab Americans. Um, these stores do not provide really anything of, of health or value to black communities. It's, it's, it's liquor, it's chips, it's processed food, it's lot lottery tickets. Um, they also, and I wish I could show you a picture of this, but um, it's just the, the whole feeling of entering one of these stores is very racist. There's this plexiglass to, between the, the owners and the customers. You're under constant surveillance. Um, in one case, uh, an Arab uh, uh, shop owner pulled a gun on a group of black children in Detroit because he thought they were stealing from the store. Um, and I actually took some comrades who visited from Palestine inside one of these stores a few years ago and they said that it felt like going through Kalandia checkpoint, just the, 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 the surveillance and, and the ways in which the store was constructed. Um, so one um, area of, of tension or contradiction between our communities and struggles is around this, this kind of um, experience where when I lived in Detroit and was um, working on building black and, and Arab solidarity, um, there were, it's not, there were a significant number of people, whether comrades or just people in the community who would say, well, why should I support Palestine if, if um, this is how I'm being treated by um, Arabs in the community, not knowing whether they come from Palestine or Lebanon or Iraq or Yemen, um, but just having kind of this generalized experience with, with Arabs in the community. And so um, what I want people to understand about the United States is that um, there's, three ways that racism tends to operate um, or even colonialism tends to operate. Um, so the, the first two are um, in violence against black and indigenous populations. And the third is, is through imperialism or violence against nations abroad and then discrimination against those immigrants when they come to the United States. Um, and so Arab Americans are discriminated against and, and most immigrants, whether they're um, South Asian, Asian from Central Latin America, uh, the Middle East, even the Caribbean and Africa who don't have the history of being enslaved in the United States, um, experience oppression, but also um, are able to be settlers on indigenous territory. And those who aren't black are able to say, participate in anti-black racism. And what I mean by that is, is many can come here and say, oh, um, look at Detroit. It's a big, poor, and Black city. Um, uh, it's either full of criminals and we're scared to go there, or yes, they're suffering, but at least our situation isn't that bad. So let's just keep to our own area and, and let them um, leave them to the side. Um, th this is a, this, due to the divide and conquer structure of the United States, this is a position that many immigrant populations take when coming to the United States or even operating shops in our communities as a way to build wealth um, and to, to build them, get them a step higher on the so-called ladder of, uh, what's the phrase? Just, just moving them up the ladder of the, towards the American dream. Um, and so beyond this issue of, of like gas stations um, or, or liquor stores, there's a second issue of anti-Black racism that we really need um, all of our comrades, uh, whoever they are, to work against. And that's the passive acceptance of um, really unacceptable conditions of Black suffering and Black death. Um, so in a city like Detroit, people's water is being shut off to their homes if they can't afford to pay their bills. Um, there are people who are being kicked out of their houses um, for, for, for being unable to... It's more complicated than unable to afford paying for it um, because in many ways the 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 state is, is, is responsible, um, but the people don't have access to food um, that is healthy for them or, or beneficial to them. We have inadequate public health. Um, black people were, suffered the most, black and indigenous people suffered the most under the coronavirus pandemic um, because this country is structurally set up so that we do not have adequate health care. Um, so there's any number of issues that I think are important that we need solidarity on and, and not just solidarity, but 
tangible action and support to demand having these resources for our communities. Um, but th this is an area where uh, our, our Arab comrades in the United States um, really need to, to step up. Um, yeah, and I, I, I think I just wanna pause here, um, Murad, to see if, if you have any reflections or, or additional thoughts on this topic um, and kind of what your experience was of this coming in from uh, Palestine and witnessing the dynamics here. Yeah, I second what you said, and it's um, here coming as an immigrant in, in the States, and um, you can feel racism, and you can feel um, all the oppression that is happening, and you can, like, um, the system is trying to convince you that you can uh, climb that ladder, and you can see that it's easier for you than even than uh, Black and Indigenous people in this land. and if you are not conscious about every step you are moving, uh, you, you, you will participate in the oppression and you need to be conscious about that. Um, where are you renting? Like if you are renting a house, where, where is your money is going? If you are buying uh, things, if you are working with communities, if every aspect in life, just as Mia, it helps me to think about it. Um, just I'm as I'm dealing with boycott and divestment and sanction for the Israeli products and goods and everything, I'm doing the same here in the U.S. Just to be conscious about every step I'm doing to um, be uh, to support our black and indigenous uh, brothers and sisters. Um, it has been really um, for us as Palestinians the George Floyd uh, murder. Um, and the fact that a Palestinian was uh, um, the store owner and just raised a lot of questions for us Palestinians here and back home, where like to address anti-blackness in our community and how, what we can do about it. And I know that there are so many conversations uh, are happening to address this issue and how uh, to replace these acts and these uh, um, uh, actions that our community here are doing um, and to educate and raise awareness and to exceed our circles, not only with the organizers and that's it. How can we reach our people who are not part of those circles who are working in the street with the community? How to raise awareness and to replace these, um, um, to, to swim against the current uh, in this country and to replace those actions with uh, actions that uh, divest and invest in a black struggle. As you just said, uh, Christian, and um, uh, I completely support that. And I agree with this mentality of your money should go to black businesses, to um, uh, black farmers and support uh, the stuff around you. Just be conscious about what you are doing here in this country. Um, yeah, and um, you know, just the fact that it's always thinking about it when I saw George Floyd and when I saw Muhammad Arakat, back home, when you go, when you go out, when you leave your home, you say goodbye to your friends, to your family, as if it's the last time you will see them. You say goodbye to them and leave because you don't know what happens with you. If a soldier will stop you while driving, while in the streets or whatever, even in your home, sleeping in your bedroom, you might be killed. This is why you say goodbye and really um, to your friends and family. And when you see them again, you hug them, you appreciate them every second because you don't know when that will happen again. It's the same here. People who leave their home, they might not come back for no reason. There's no reason. Someone in the car um, driving on the street might be stopped by a cop uh, in their homes as we saw um, in, in the news, like it's it's similar, it's, it's so similar. And same time, it's different with, his, with the history, but what we need to learn is, is now there is a revolution here in the United States that is, it, it's the most, maybe if not the most beneficial for, for all the struggles around the world, knowing the US position in oppressing other people around the world. How are we supporting this? Wherever you are in Palestine or here in the US, just you need to be consciously existing and connecting with other struggles. Now through Corona, uh, the virus, we've been connecting 
and it's a call from us, all of us around the world. We have this uh, opportunity to use the connections, Zoom meetings and all the conversations that has been happening. I don't need to be physically there to be reconnected with people. And it's time to get away from the, the, the roads that the systems are creating us to go through um, like with connections and to who are our allies. We have the chance and the opportunity to build new connections. I learned from the Zapatistas more than uh, the four years I spent in the university. Uh, these things that to re-question the knowledge that we are getting, the experiences, the tools that we use to, for our revolution and to get back to our indigenous knowledge, our knowledge that connects us, our knowledge that is what I call the real hope because the fake hope that the system produce will not get us anywhere. It's only a band-aid. It's only like, um, um, to slow us down, to not to preserve us, not to explode or, or not to um, make this act of revolution to the end, to its fullest, where it needs to be. Real hope comes from people. Real, real hope comes from other people, revolutionaries around the world. Uh, this is the connection we want wherever we are, because if we are to build anything and accumulate on our struggles, we need to get rid of the tools that the systems have been providing us forever and build new things, new tactics, uh, connect with each other. We don't need a lot of explanations uh, why we should be together. We are together because we are in pain and that's enough for us to break this pain. We don't want to be in pain anymore and maybe the fight is what we have now. Maybe the, I, I was someone, um, a friend of mine just contacted me and say, it must be hard for you and hopeless uh, because of annexation and what's happening in Palestine. And I told him, it's the most hopeful moment in my life now because people are doing something. And this is like the movement, as I said, when, when things are still, we are farther from reality. If things are moving and people are in action, this is where I, we feel hopeful. And this is why we are hopeful here in the US and everywhere else in the world. We call for all our brothers and sisters around, around the world to reconnect and rebring, reroot themselves with their indigenous knowledge and how to connect with each other on that basis. Thank you, Rafiq. Um, on your side, well, I wanted to see if you have anything to weigh in with um, just around anti-Black racism, navigating solidarity from different communities and, and these topics. Yeah, for sure. Um, first thing I want to say is that um, the the comparisons you were making, Murad, between conditions of colonized people, particularly African and indigenous people in the United States, and what's being done to Palestinian people in occupied Palestine by Israel, um, really resonated with me because the you know knee on neck tactic that was used to murder George Floyd was taught to U.S. police by Israeli police in the deadly exchange program, and the U.S. police agencies regularly send, you know, trainers to Central and South America and the Caribbean to train the police there about how to repress and brutalize indigenous and African people. So like building these transnational connections between our movements is essential because the enemy is transnational in nature. They are constantly um, exchanging strategies. They are constantly like, you know, engaged in like an armed race against us where they're helping each other learn new tactics to brutalize us. So yeah, definitely that's what that made me think about. Like I did not know that until I saw pictures of Israeli police kneeling on Palestinian necks. And then I read about, you know, a, an Israeli uh, police training program that was held in Minneapolis. And I was like, oh, oh, that's why this happened. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely, like we have to recognize the transnational nature of the enemy's strategy and make our strategy in response also be transnational connecting struggles. And then in terms of like, um, you know, anti-African sentiments among colonized people in the United States, like that's kind of like the price, like the ticket, that's the ticket you pay. Like basically you have to commit to erasing indigenous people and you have to commit to dehumanizing um, uh, African people in the US. And that's how you can become a citizen. Like we saw with Irish people, we saw with Italian people, we're seeing it increasingly with East Asian people, we're seeing it increasingly with, uh, you know, Latinx people. Um, so it's kind of like the price of the ticket, right? In order to, to become American, which it's debatable whether that's even attainable if you're not European, to be honest with you, but to, in order to like the, what they tell you is in order to become American, you have to shit on us. Pardon my language. Um, and what folks have to realize is that you are not ever going to be American. 
it is conditional as hell. And like the clearest example of that is, you know, um, colonized people from all over the world who enlist in the US military, who are now, as we speak, facing deportation because there's a white nationalist US president who said, you know what? I actually don't want you to be a citizen anymore and we're gonna take that shit back and you can go back to where the fuck you came from. And so I'm, I, I have a potty mouth. And so if it's like a problem, please let me know. But, but, but basically like they, they, will, they will let you, you know, be weaponized against us. They will let you put on the uniform, whether it's a police uniform, whether it's a military uniform, they will send you around the world and into our neighborhoods to brutalize us. And then they will take that stuff back. They will say, we don't want you anymore go back. And that has been the pattern for the entire history of the United States. And so there's like a moral argument when it comes to solidarity with African people, like just like the comment said in the beginning, there are many, many struggles that would not have been possible if not for the National Liberation Organization of African people on this land. Like we've created that space for a lot of folks. But also, so that's like the moral piece, but also on a pragmatic level, the U.S. is, not, is a very fickle friend. The U.S. is like racist and white nationalist at its core. And so if you are not of European descent and also of a particular class, the U.S.'s loyalty to you is extremely conditional. They'll take that shit back at any time. So you can come on the winning team or you can side with the U.S. and get sold out eventually. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, and just to our, our viewers, we're soon going to move into uh, Q&A. Um, so if you have questions, um, you can either put them in the chat or, or we'll hear other ways for um, you to share those. Um, but I just wanted to offer a, a reflection to um, our comrades in the Vlad um, to help you understand the structural position um, that, that Palestinians and Arab Americans are, uh, uh, have here in the United States. Um, so listening to Onisan would talk about how um, colonized people can come to this territory, put on a military um, uniform or police uniform and oppress our communities, thinking that they will um, uh, be blessed by the, the white people or the colonizers. Um, that's the position that I view the, the Ethiopians um, who are uh, living in Israel and, and occupied territory as occupying. Um, from what I understand, um, the Ethiopians can be some of the, the most brutal or, or, or violent of the soldiers against Palestinians because they feel like they have something to prove to their, their white counterparts. Um, but um, it, the, I, I think the, the situation here, it would be as if, if I moved to Palestine somewhere in 48 and decided that um, I was going to spend my energy trying to convince the Knesset and the Israelis to make the U.S. stopped being racist towards Black people. Um, but I, I wasn't really doing, I, I put my energy more in that direction instead of actually standing in solidarity and in struggle with our Palestinian comrades. Um, that, that's kind of the, the position that, that Palestinian Americans in the U.S. take where there's lots of appeals to our colonizers, to the Congress, to the white society, um, to stop aid to Israel, to be in solidarity with Palestine. Um, but there there's, needs to be much, 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 much more work in solidarity with us as colonized people on, on this territory. And so to me, um, the, the, a lot of uh, people here in the U.S. get stuck on this issue of anti-Black racism within the Arab community. They say, oh, like, how do we get Ammo to stop saying Abid when talking about Black people? Or, or, or it just becomes very internal and circular. And to me, the answer to addressing that issue is to engage in material action and solidarity. So if you're Palestinian and are not able to go back home, um, like maybe if you went home, you would help uh, farmers in Palestine harvest their olives. And maybe you would help them defend their land from settlers. You can go to Detroit and help a black farmer harvest uh, uh, her crops and help defend her land from settlers who are also trying to take the territory. Um, you can help black people uh, uh, fight being evicted from their homes in the same way that we would want to help Palestinians um, um, uh, stay in their homes from Israeli um, eviction. Um, there's really a whole wealth of, of solidarity that um, anybody living on this territory can take um, to support our struggle, but it just requires um, a lot more depth and a lot more 
um, uh, kind of tangible action. And what, one thing that I, I left out earlier in my reflection on just the, the, the Black Panther moment um, is that Black revolution is, I would argue, the greatest threat to the US empire. We are the largest oppressed population within this territory. We've been oppressed for over 400 years. Um, we are not such a small minority that, like in some cities, we're, we're a, a majority. So we, when we organize, we can stop the production of goods and materials. We can shut down cities during protests and uprisings. When we're organized and thinking on a revolutionary and strategic level, as we were doing in the, the 60s and the 70s, um, we, we, we literally have the power to tie up the empire from inside um, and to, to be in solidarity with the, the victims of this empire outside. Um, so for our Palestinian comrades that live in the United States, we really need you to invest in black liberation um, because th that's the only way that Palestine gets free is if the conditions that allow the US to be an imperial force and oppress black people don't exist anymore. Um, and and we're, we're the best way to get to that point. Um, so even if, if people don't care about black people uh, uh, individually, that you, you kind of have to care because um, it, it, there is no freedom without our, our freedom um, is, is what I hope people can, can take away. Um, so yeah, I, that's kind of my last thought before we move into discussion um, on Yasan Moon Murad. I want to see if you have any additional comments, but other than that, I, I do see a hand from SAFE and there might be some other questions as well. Uh, go ahead, Hatem. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all for uh, the different uh, points that you raised. Uh, this was a uh, very important uh, talking points, um, really. Uh, I also have um, uh, two people uh, who wants to comment. Um, uh, first, uh, Khaled Barakat, uh, who wants to uh, say a few words. So please, Khaled, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Thank you so much for uh all of these analysis and information, it's really needed. And I think we were right when we say that we want to focus on the alternative revolution, the revolutionary perspective on the Palestinian and the Arab uh, side in particular, and to hear revolutionary voices as well. Because in Palestine, as in the United States, our movements have different trends and political views. There are the reactionary Palestinians and the conservative ones, and there are the reactionary uh, and conservative black folks who claim to represent the black people struggle in the United States. You know this more than we do, so sometimes we kind of uh, refrain from speaking about our internal uh, challenges as movements, whether in Palestine or in the United States, but I think that this have obstructed revolutionary self-criticism in our part. And part of that is the our struggle in the United States with our community in terms of building bridges between the Palestinians and the Blacks in the United States and on a movement-to-movement -movement, uh, basis and not individuals uh, or uh, some academics to with some academics. These are not genuine representation of the two people struggle. It has to be on a larger, genuine, honest movement to movement relationship. And that's the only way that we can actually move forward in terms of strengthening the relationship between our two movements is when we look at the diversity and the contradictions in each, uh, in each side. And just uh, be you know blatant and honest about uh, you know, um, the challenges that, that we face together. Um, as someone who lived in the United States for uh, 14 years and uh, I was involved with the youth movement, you know, the Palestinian youth movement and, and the Latinos and the Blacks, and I, I learned uh, through practical, uh, uh, you know, um, day, daily practice of, of, of what uh, our struggle should look like uh, and how do we want it to look like. And so, yes, we had a lot of challenges 
with some of the grocers, for example, in our communities and the way they carry their business. And we had um, real uh, issues with them. But uh, it's important to realize that the colonizers always try to put, uh, you know, uh, a system, a buffer zone that will, uh, in order for us to, to play uh, us against each other. Uh, we struggle with our people back home that, you know, soldiers who come from Ethiopia and some Somalia and Africa and brutalize our people in Palestine are not uh, representatives of uh, Africans. Uh, they are just Zionist, uh, you know, uh, soldiers, and we should not distinguish them, for example, from other soldiers who are uh, uh, not blacks, but at the same time to understand why Israel do these things and why the United States do these things, why colonizers always create these uh, these uh, complexity relationship. So, in, in my question is that in in Palestine we are witnessing today how the Palestinian leadership is selling out our rights and how the those who were revolutionaries in the 60s and 70s today, they are uh, oppressing our people. Now, these are the Palestinian so-called leaders, the leadership. Uh, some of them actually used to sit with the Black Panthers in Beirut and in Amman in the 60s. And today they are working for the Israelis. So reality changed. And in order for us to confront these, uh, I, I'd, I'd like to hear your opinion on the internal challenges on this level in terms of the Black Liberation Movement. Um, and, and thank you so much. Thank you, Khaled. Um, and Hatsum, you said, was there someone else um, in this? Yes, yeah. you guys want to answer uh, Khaled's question first, then we go to the next, or? Uh, I, I prefer to take a few questions just so we can okay. have a uh, Next, we have Saif. Saif, go ahead, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you all. Christian, uh, Anusao, Hatim, and Khaled, thank you all for a great uh, panel that we're all learning from. I actually have a question. Maybe it's a two parts question, actually. It's about something that you discussed. You discussed the right of self determination of Black people in the United States. And uh, I just want to point out that probably the majority of the Palestinians, we look at the right of self determination as in the right to our land and that we are. Our identity is that we are Palestinians, so we do not want to be Israeli citizens with equal rights. We want to maintain our Palestinian identity and we want to live on that land as Palestinians. So uh, there were a lot of talks, especially with with the with the rising of the Bernie Sanders movement, that uh, that the the regime or the system might be able to support the working class of their country, similar to what happened in the United Kingdom, while maintaining their imperialist. A strategy all around the world. So do you believe uh, in, in, in the Black movement that there might be any good change that would come from supporting progressive or so-called, quote-unquote, progressive uh, candidates within the system, within the democratic uh, elections that happens in the United States? And how do you see the, the right of self-determination? Uh, do you see yourself, because I, I know that some that a lot of the uh, black activists, they do not define them as African Americans. They're Africans, they're black people, and they have their own identity. So are we talking about, we're not talking, are we talking about equal rights? Are we talking about, like, how do you see it? This is my question. How do you say the right of self-determination? And uh, the second part of my question is about the BDS, because we talked about a lot of immigrants that come to the US and uh, Arabs or other immigrants that come to the US and some, sometimes they are a part of that oppression uh, system. Sometimes they support the struggle of indigenous and black people. Uh, I think the majority of the Palestinians support the BDS, boycott, adjustment and sanctions. And we do not think that anyone should go, for example, walk into an Israeli embassy and get a tourist visa and go just chill at the uh, beaches in Tel Aviv or migrate to Israel. We think this is a forbidden thing to do. And we think this is an act of treason actually. So how do you look at uh, the strategy of boycott within the migrant community. Would you be adopt like do you adopt the boycott, divestment, and sanctions? And do you think that uh, people around the world, especially with people with people that have a similar struggle to yours, should boycott, boycott the whole system, the whole country, uh, or only the the um, 
the tools that this regime or this system use to uh, as uh, to oppress the black people and the indigenous people. And thank you again. And that was my question. Thank you, Saif. Um, I I I don't. I'm still thinking about this. So, uh, on Yasanmu or Murad, if either of you have initial thoughts, you can go. I had some thoughts. Um, so to the first question about how, you know, like Ethiopian Africans are used in Israel for the Zionist project about, you know, colonized people being enlisted into imperialist projects as like the foot soldiers. Unlike the comment pointed out, that's like extremely common. Um, like basically since the, the, the first Europeans that put on the shores of Africa, they were playing that divide and conquer kind of strategy where they would enlist some of us um, particularly those of us who were like in elevated social classes um, into the project of oppressing the rest of us. So that's like a very old and extremely effective tactic. And we even see it in the modern day, obviously with the case of African and colonized people who are police officers in the US who are ICE agents, who are FBI agents, who are all, like, all up and down in the um, oppressive state apparatus within settler society in the United States. But we also see it in Africa with AFRICOM, with Africans enlisted into the US military being deployed to our homeland to oppress the African people living there. And in a couple of situations in, I believe it was Mozambique, and another one was in Kenya, um, indigenous Africans like straight up killed, no, it wasn't, it wasn't in Mozambique, it was in Niger. Indigenous Africans straight up killed the, U, the Africans enlisted in the US military because they were like, we don't want you here you're bringing terrorism, you might look like us, but you're working for the enemy. And so they were murdered. And in the case of the Africans in Niger, they enlisted Africans in the military, their bodies were like kept and like uh, uh, mutilated because that was like a level of anger um, from the Africans living in the continent. And to be honest with you, I do not feel like um, victims of imperialism, whether they be in Palestine, whether they be in Africa, have any obligation to solidarity with you if you show up on their land in a US military uniform. Like that's it. Like we need to consider the Africans enlisted in those projects as our responsibility to like pull away from that. But if they're not pulled away, then you get what you get, to be honest with you. And I feel like that's like the line, like we have to like throw out, you know, the, the reactionary identity reductionism where we're like, if they look like us, they're automatically on our side. We automatically have to like, you know, show up for them. Like that's not the case. If you wear a US military uniform and you go to Kenya and drone bomb a family, whatever the people in Kenya do to you is on you. That's your fault. I feel like we have to recognize is the primary strategy of imperialism in this particular time. We have to recognize the class contradictions within African and colonized communities and we have to move accordingly. We have been way too romantic about the whole skin folk, kin folk question. And it has re resulted in like, you know, the first African US president who was directly responsible for expanding the US military's footprint in Africa. It has led to many, many folks that look like us doing straight up sellout shit that advances imperialism's power around the world. And we just cannot, we can't accept that anymore. And it's on us to interrupt it. Um, and then on the question of, uh, you know, Bernie Sanders and putting our energy into electing progressive politicians within settler states, like, I think that that is an extremely flawed strategy. Like if you uh, increase the welfare, if you strengthen the welfare state in an imperialist nation, that welfare state is going to be paid for by the imperialist conquest of the rest of the world. Like if US imperialism is not interrupted, if the US military is not disbanded and defunded, all you're really doing is making sure that the profits from the US exerting its power, um, exploiting the rest of the world is just more equitably distributed within the US population. Like I don't accept that as a liberatory strategy. I refuse as a colonized person, as an African woman, to say that I'm gonna allow my life to get better on your back, particularly the back of Africa, but the back of any colonized person. And I feel like, yeah, the left in the United States is compromised in a lot of ways, to be frank. It's just like, they have accepted the bargain where the entire rest of the world is looted and exploited in exchange for better conditions here. And all Bernie Sanders, all the Sanders campaign represented was that on like a very, very big scale and like framed in progressive language. Because when Bernie Sanders talked, when people were like, Bernie Sanders, how are you going to pay for Medicare for all? Bernie Sanders, how are you going to pay for free college? The obvious answer, the obvious answer was taking money from the US military, taking the money from the Pentagon. But the man never said that. And when you look at his positions when it comes to foreign policy, when you look at his positions when it comes to US imperialism, he is motherfucking lockstep. He is lockstep. 
He supports sanctions on Venezuela. He opposes BDS. He, he, he engaged in demonization of Iran and all Iran has ever done is resist US imperialism. So he was like in lockstep when it came to most US foreign policy, people tried to frame him as progressive, but when it came to how that shit was gonna get paid for, he was absolutely fine to take the blood money from US military conquests. And that's like the case across the board for all progressive political figures in the United States because to hold elected office in the United States, you have to accept the settler state project. You have to accept U.S. imperialism. So if you if you are like against that in any way, you're never going to make it to that position. And so we, as you know, revolutionaries in the belly of the beast, revolutionaries in the heart of the empire, we cannot accept that deal point blank. Period. We cannot say that we're going to let our lives get better on your backs because the only reason the U.S. is a superpower is because the U.S. exploited the entire rest of the world and enslaved our ancestors and committed genocide against indigenous peoples. We cannot accept that as something that we want to save or be part of. We have to reject it in its entirety. That's our responsibility. So yeah, that's my thoughts on that. I'm just going to let us sit with that for a moment and also give the translators a, a brief pause. But um, for those who are on Zoom, the, the comments here are just lighting up with praise and, and thanks on the Um yeah, I, I, I can't really follow that, but um, I, I, I think there's a few issues that we do have um, uh, as Black people and within the, the, the Black movement. Um, one is that we're, we're not all on the same page about, as Onisan was already said, what we are and what we want to be. Um, in the sense that I, I what am I trying to say? I think for most Black people, the end result is like equality within the state um, or ambivalence about like equality within the state, but uncertainty about what, what our options are um, for a struggle outside of the US. Um, not many people are thinking of our, us as colonized people who deserve self-determination. Um, and so it makes it very difficult to um, advance a political program or project um, that can unify the diaspora and that the outside world can relate to. Um, and and it's, it, it makes it hard for us to have our own kind of BDS um, movement or call. Like it's, sure, yes, please boycott the United States, um, but the, the what to what end? Um, I like, I. I I don't think there's a unified kind of set of hands that we have as Black people, even as Black activists or, or revolutionaries as to what we want um, operation to look like. And so that makes it very difficult to, both for us to organize internally, but also to um, have kind of robust um, international solidarity. Um, and I, I think, I mean, so I, I, I know the general picture about how our leader, leadership has failed over the last few decades, but um, one kind of constant throughout the Black history and, and Black struggle is the, the presentation of um, the quote-unquote moderate versus the quote-unquote radical or revolutionary, um, and using the moderate voice to silence like very clear revolutionary aims and demands of, of um, Black activists. And so in the absence of um, a strong voice like the Black Panthers, um, we're left with a lot of individual leaders who have been co-opted into the Democratic Party um, or who do their work primarily through NGOs um, and are like stuck trying to get money from foundations. Um, but it's really kind of watered down the level of political discourse and analysis that we have. Um, and I, I don't know how we get out of that, uh, to be honest. And maybe that's a question if you if you have thoughts on that, Anya Samu. Yeah, it's really difficult because the, you know, NGOs, the nonprofits, the petty bourgeois elements of our people like take up all the air in the room. <laughs> like if you like if I was gonna say I wanna write an op-ed 
about Pan-Africanism and how the liberation and unification of Africa and just scientific socialism is the only thing that's going to realize the liberation of African people, there is no chance whatsoever that I could get that published in the New York Times. But if I wanted to say that Joe Biden is the one and only hope uh, of African people in this particular time and we have to unify, get, get Trump out of office and get Biden in there so he can do imperial shit, that would get published by probably like all sorts of people. Like right now, the like the most visible political spaces are dominated by neo-colonialist political strategies, by petty bourgeois political strategies, and revolutionary nationalist African organizations and African political analysis is like just like completely erased in the mainstream. And the strategy, so the strategy that I've been pursuing, the strategy that APRP pursues is to like make our own lane, to make our own platforms, to make our own cultural work to make our own outlets to get our voices out there because we know for a fact that the people who control the mainstream platforms are not gonna to listen to us. And so that's, that's what Hood Communist is. That's why we did that. It's a collective of uh, Africans and revolutionary nationalist organizations, the African People's Revolutionary Party, Black Hammer, the Udima's People Party, um, Black Alliance for Peace, all together created this outlet where we feature nothing but revolutionary African nationalist voices um, giving analysis on all sorts of topics relevant to our struggle. Um, it's the same, like my, my chapter in New Mexico does a weekly show every single Thursday where we give analysis on the pandemic and on you know uh, conditions of African people around the world from our perspective and we do it on Facebook and YouTube and Twitter. Like these platforms are essential for getting our words out there uncorrupted, unfiltered. And while the audience is going to be obviously drastically smaller than that of like a New York Times op-ed, I still believe that, you know, revolutionary African nationalist voices and revolutionary like colonized nationalist voices have to create our own spaces and build our own audience so that we can be, have our voices and analysis out there uncorrupted. Like, I think that's the strategy we have to pursue is just make our own lanes, make our own spaces because they're just not going to make room for us because what we do is a threat to everything they believe and everything they own. And thank you. And we, we especially need that on a transnational level to be able to just have these conversations and share media and knowledge across movements. Um, so I, we have a comment from um, Hamid Khatib. Um, Hamid, you can join. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you all for all of this amazing presentation and very informative and precise one. And, uh, and also, it was very important to listen from, uh, uh, from all of you uh, with building all of this connection and going deep within the, like self-criticism within our movement. But I have some, let's say, like points maybe for discussion or just an opinion. I want to ask, can we recognize the refugees and migrants who are coming to the United States from countries who are distracted and living under colonialism until today? in different forms of colonialism. And the main player on this game is the United States and this empire. As a settlers, I think this is wrong and unfair. Uh, the second thing, the class issue. Uh, we didn't really pass on this because this will help us as well to understand who is those migrants because there is different for a Palestinian uh, company owner in California who have an IT company. Uh, than a poor Iraqi person in a na black neighborhood coming from Baghdad after the war and all of this destruction. This is totally different and we know how mentally this affects people and how, as Khaled mentioned as well, how the United States and the Israelis as well and all these forms of apartheid are representing themselves. For example, as myself was grown in a refugee camp as Palestinians, I grew up hating Jewish. This is very clear, not because I hated Jewish, but because our enemy in everyday, everyday basis, in every picture, he present himself to us as a Jewish. They never say Zionist. They say we are a Jewish state. So uh, what I expect from the, so this kind of racism, I think we have to discuss it more, is different than, I live in Belgium, for example, and I, I live in a black neighborhood and where there is a status of Leopold Du who, who, who killed more than 15 million of, of Congolese. So this will, will pass me to a second point that I know that, that we have to fight the empire from within. And I know that the United States is the leading power in this imperialist world. But as well as Palestinians, when we say black people, 
we have to link more with Africa, with the black countries, with the black national liberation movement who need our support as Palestinians and also at the black people who live in the United States. Because there as well, where people are today are brutally uh, 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 smashed. This is, I, I have been in South Africa a few months ago. And it was shocked for me even that I am Palestinian. I never saw, I never witnessed a settler society, but I still can see settler society today in South Africa. African people in Johannesburg are uh, smashed and poor. Uh, uh, they are not equal in any forms of equal, this uh, equality, whatever the, yeah, it's called. And we have experience as Palestinian people, even the BDS movement today and the BICAP movement, we learn it through and practical participation in our solidarity with the South African struggle. And that's where the Palestinian boycott movement coming in from. So also here we have to think more how to radicalize and to revolutionize our BDS movement and our relationship with each other movement as a Palestinian movement and as a black movement. Uh, today, we all spoke about the NGO role and about the big foundation role and money. And this is where limit us from our forms of struggle that we are practicing as Palestinians. This is blocking us from building connection uh, with, uh, with ourselves. And at the same time, it's terrorizing us because we start believing that every act we do of resistance is scary and it's dangerous and this is not effective as well. By and the fucking international law, uh, the, the United Nations uh, protect the right of self-determination for people and using all forms of resistance. This is by law, it's granted for people. And then any way of attack by the state, this is where we have to fight back, not to change our forms of struggle and then start to put, to put thousands of walls between our movements and in the end we say, how we can build our practical movement. This is, will never be effective without practical practice, practicing of all forms of solidarity and joint struggle. And if we cannot do this with the black movement in the United States, because the level of oppression is different, today South Africa is open for Palestinian people uh, and other uh, African countries. And from there, we can build as well our relationship with the black movement. And then we go back to that because this has been going on, going on, but have been going on between the reactionary forces in our movements. There is plenty of Palestinian people are visiting South Africa every day, but not all of them are going there for looking forward for a revolutionary alternative for relationship between black and Palestinian people, but they are going there to build a relationship between the liberal and between the corrupted leadership between the black movement and the Palestinian movement. And this is where we have to bring the Palestinian people in the refugee camp in the Heishi and in El Helwi to Soweto and not to the five stars institutions in South Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you, comrade. Um, I 100% agree with you on, on everything. Um, um, I think to, to flesh out, of, of course, victims of imperialism um, are victims of imperialism in the United States and um, refugees and everyone needs to be supported in their own struggles. Um, let's say, well, let's even say we're not, we won't call these people settlers. Um, they still are able to participate in a, a project of, of um, or inherit um, a project of, of settlement or, or theft of indigenous land um, and resources. Um, and so from, from my analysis, there is, we all have an obligation to uh, oppose those conditions of imperialism, but um, those comrades in general have an obligation to also support the indigenous struggles of this territory um, as, as black and, and indigenous revolution. Um, and I appreciate your intervention about class because that is very important to acknowledge in the conversation um, um, about just relations between Arab and black communities and immigrant communities in general in the United States. Um, it is worth noting that obviously the, the strongest examples of solidarity between our struggles are coming from the, the working class. Um, um, there's like community centers that are run by, by working class Palestinians in cities like Chicago that have for decades 
um, offered support to, um, uh, to, to, to Black communities. Um, they're the ones who are going and talking to the shop owners um, to get money to donate to Black organizations. Um, all of this tends to get left out of conversations because they're, they're very much rooted in like either academia or middle class um, uh, 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 communities. Um, but yes, thank you for, for raising the class issue. And just, um, I, it's re really, really important um, that we have more engagement with struggles on the continent, um, both learning from revolutionaries and, and anti-colonial movements, but also building active relationships today. Um, because I, I agree with you, that's where we are able to meet as Palestinians from the Blad and Africans living in the United States. Um, and in, in the same way that uh, just, we won't be free until the continent is free from colonialism and destruction and actually has reparations and justice for all the violence and looting that it has experienced. Um, and I imagine that Onyesangu has more to say on this. Yeah, absolutely. I think that is essential within the African national liberation struggle and also the national liberation struggles that connect with ours to uphold the primacy of Africa, to uphold like, cent like centering Africa within this struggle. Uh, serious political mistake, historical mistake that's made within our struggle with the United States is folks starting it um, at slavery, starting, you know, our oppression as African people, the story starting at the beginning of the trans like the slave trade, when the reality is uh, Europeans were attempting to make incursions, um, were stealing land, were enslaving African people on the continent 100 years or more before the trans like the slave trade started. So super, super important to begin the story of the African liberation struggle on the African continent. Also because, you know, the African continent, like the anti-colonial struggles there, particularly in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, represent the highest possible expression of Black power, represent African people organizing as a mass to overthrow colonial capitalist societies and institute African, pan-African socialist revolutionary societies. So we did that in place after place after place on that land. And that is like an incredible lesson for us because we're not free. But those are situations where we took our future into our collective hands and changed it. So there's remarkable things that we could learn from those anti-colonial struggles on the continent. And those lessons, they, they first, they like separate us from Africa, right? First, they say, you know, you don't have an African name. You don't remember your language, you don't remember your religion. Your history starts here. Like that's not your home anymore. So they work very, very intentionally to separate us as African people from our home. And then they say, those struggles have nothing to do with you. Focus on the Civil Rights Act, focus on like these assimilation strategies. Don't worry about the successful anti-colonial struggles that overthrew white power, that overthrew settler states, that overthrew capitalism. They try, to, they try to pretend like we're part of like a whole separate thing, like a separate continuum. And that's like something else over there that we need, don't need to worry about. And that's intentional. That's intentional. They don't want us to learn from those strategies because those strategies were successful to defeat them. But when it comes to like um, the example of Azania, it's actually really, so, so that's the, the anti-colonial, the African people's name for South Africa, it's Azania. So when it comes to the example of Azania though, it's like a really, really instructive in terms of the danger of allowing a national liberation struggle, an anti-colonial struggle to be reframed as an anti-racist struggle. The struggle for land and power in Azania became focused on the struggle against apartheid, on the struggle against um, racism. And so when the national liberation movements, when the armed struggle in Azania um, became like forced, forced the settler state into negotiations, it became about like, you know, equal power somehow between settlers and indigenous people it became about like trying to form like a joint government on stolen land. Like the land is like still stolen. They made it about, we'll be less racist to you while we're continuing to actively steal your land. Like that is bananas to me. And that's like a lesson that we need to take that if we cannot allow an anti-colonial struggle to be reframed as an anti-racist struggle, because what that does is uphold the legitimacy of the settler state by saying, if we make this genocidal land stealing state less racist, somehow that's liberation for you. So African people in the United States should learn a lot from the example of Azania and the example of how that struggle unfolded after the apartheid government was forced to negotiate. Oh yeah, and the other thing I want to say is that like, yeah, I agree on centering, sorry, <laughs> I agree on the, um, centering Africa. I agree on upholding the primacy of Africa. I think that's key to us um, winning liberation. When Africa is free, African people everywhere are going to be free. But I also believe that African people within the United States are going to play a decisive role 
because I think Christian said earlier, like we're in the belly of the beast. We are poised to strike at the heart of this monster. We are, my comment always says like, we're the X factor here because the ruling class of the United States has no idea which way we're gonna go. Sometimes we're like, you know, vote for Biden, blah, blah, blah. And sometimes we're burning down whole cities. And that has been the case for the entire, our entire history on this land, no matter what they do, no matter what strategies they try, no matter how they attempt to assimilate us, no matter how they attempt to co-opt our struggle, there's always the conflagration. It never stops. We never stop um, attacking the core of the system. So we are the X factor. We can. We are going to be decisive in the struggle against U.S. empire. And so it's extremely important while upholding Africa to understand the unique position of Africans in the United States. Beautiful. Um, so we're we're closing out. Um, I do want to uh, just apologize for leaving this bit out earlier, um, but I, I think when we discuss um, liberation movements, we talked in the general, but we miss some of the specific struggles that happen within um, our communities and within our struggles. So I, I just do want to name that one of the biggest contributions of this last five or six years under Black Lives Matter has been a focus on um, state violence and intercommunal violence against Black women. Um, and also against Black LGBT people and really centering women and LGBT people in our liberation struggles um, with an understanding that, that just intercommunal violence is, or discrimination is not going to serve us um, if we're trying to fight for the collective liberation of our, of our people. Um, that women and gay people and transgender people are part of our struggles, um, which is something that Onyesanu and I each believe in and are represented in our organizations. Um, but we, we just want to communicate to our, our comrades um, abroad that these are struggles that we view as important and that we hope that you also um, um, continue to make space to fight against discrimination within our communities against our people. Yeah, I would also add that like, you know, propagating queer phobia, transphobia, homophobia within colonized communities was a, was a divide and conquer tactic of colonialism. Like all of the anti-sodomy laws, homophobic laws that exist on the African continent that exist in the Caribbean were started by the motherfucking British. So like they literally went to our indigenous societies and systematically created structures that would marginalize queer and trans colonized and African people. And so it's a clear paper trail that that's what happened. And so as part of the anti-colonial uh, strategy, we have to intentionally um, up like unpack that history and unpack that strategy and interrupt it interrupt it by being intentional about making our anti-colonial movements spaces that are safe for queer and trans african people but also put them in positions of leadership and also um create like a broad mass consciousness about how the strategy was used so it doesn't happen again thank you Th that'll be my final remarks so up, up, up to you Hudson. all right Thank you all. Uh, thank you to the speakers for all of the different points that you raised today. We conclude our uh, 15th uh, webinar series as part of the revolutionary alternative. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, the least that we can do right now is to host webinars like this uh, as a form of solidarity uh, with the uh, black communities here in the US. Uh, and I hope that we continue building with each other as we all mentioned, uh, that we continue learning from each other and, and supporting each other. Um, thanks to uh, all of the attendees. Bashkar al Jamia, Jamia al Hadur al Yom, Heik Mkun Nikhtatamna, Al Nadwal Hamstash, La Silsila al Badil al Thawri, and Inshallah Minshuf Kaman Arib. Thank you, everyone, and uh, bye bye. Mm -hmm.